Hi everyone, Lisa here at Pushing the Limits. Today I have a fabulous guest for you. I have my friend Craig Anthony Harper, a legend in the fitness industry in Australia, broadcaster, podcaster, author, PhD candidate, a very interesting human being. And today we are riffing on everything around metacognition, philosophy, we talk about how to get people to do behavioral change, how to understand your own brain and why it sometimes sabotages you <laughs> in your mission to do things in life, why you can't always control the way you you, you act, even though you know better. Um, so lots of um, great insights with my friend Craig. He's uh, really awesome. And I'd encourage you to go and check out his podcast too, The You Project. Uh, he's really, really funny. He does swear a lot, so if you are offended by swearing, I apologize up front, but he is really worth listening to. He's really funny and um, a very, very intelligent person who's um, got a lot of insights to share, so I hope you enjoy the episode with Craig. Uh, before we head over to the show, head over to lisatarmody.com. Make sure that you uh, check out what we do in the shop. We've got all our uh, anti-aging and uh, longevity supplement range, and we also have health consulting, epigenetic testing, DNA testing, uh, functional medicine testing, hyperbaric oxygen therapy clinic. I've got my books, of course. Um, speaking, if you need me to speak at uh, one of your corporate events or uh, meetings or anything like that, please reach out to me. Support at lisatamati.com is where you can find me and my team. Right now, over to the show with the lovely Craig Harper. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome into Pushing the Limits for another fantastic episode. Today, I've got my friend, Nutcase, <laughs> Craig Anthony Harper. Welcome to the show, mate. Well, that's pretty hurtful, but somewhat accurate, so I'll take it. <laughs> How are you? In the most loving way. In yeah. the most loving way. <laughs> well, I'm think, a Nutcase, too. Uh, well, I think Nutcases hang out with Nutcase. I don't know if we're allowed to say <laughs> that in 2023, but oh, if, we're calling, if we're calling each other that, I think it's okay. <laughs> you know. No, you're absolutely a legend, and I've loved, uh, you know, having you on previously. And I was on your show last week, and mm. uh, we just love sharing great uh, insights with people and what you're up to. So, um, Craig, give us a bit of background for those who don't know you. I don't know who that wouldn't know you, but maybe yeah, there's some yeah. people in New Zealand who don't know you. A lot of people don't know me, but um, yeah. So my background is in originally uh, work background anyway, in kind of sports science, fitness, health, wellness, um, working with teams as conditioning and strength coach. I set up the first personal training centers in Australia. I wrote the first course with my friend Tara. Um, I I had PT centers for when no one had them and no one knew what they were. And I employed 500 trainers over about 25 years. I had four centers. Um, <clears throat> I've always been really fascinated with human behavior and human thinking and psychology and physiology and performance. And it started with bodies. And then I realized that working with bodies was good, but understanding the people inside the body was more important. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, which kind of eventually led me to doing lots of research in that area and I'm stumbling towards the finish line of my PhD at the moment in neuropsychology and Amazing. yeah, just lots of corporate speaking and working with teams and athletes over the years and blokes in prison and working with addicts and alcoholics um, or people with addiction issues. I think we more politically correctly put it these days. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and just, yeah, just like helping people to help themselves. Like I'm really, I'm super fascinated Lisa with potential mm -hmm. and I, I was not one of those people that was born with amazing genetics like you, which is very fucking I annoying. I haven't got that. Come on. I'm a you know, and, I, and I wasn't a star <laughs> student and I couldn't sing and I couldn't dance. And <laughs> like, like my platform oh, was mediocrity. I'll break out the tissues. I'll break out the tissues. Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. But it, no, just because I wasn't great at anything, it made yeah. me really motivated. So I, I always say to people, mediocrity was my gift because- I think if I was super talented, I wouldn't have been driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and actually, I can totally relate to that because contrary to what you just said, I'm just so below average. And I've got the 
the data to say that and, and as far as ultra marathoning went yeah <laughs> the scientists the guys like you that did my vo2 mix and all of that just went yeah, no, you're, you're a complete disaster that's funny <laughs> don't give up your day job they told me did you do did you ever get your lactate threshold done yeah yeah I can't remember i can't remember but it was not good it was not wow. good nothing was good you know, there was a very famous, uh, I know we're just rambling today, but that's okay. There was a very famous Australian marathoner. I think his name was Derek Miller. And he actually held the world record for a minute, I believe, which was something like two hours, 12 or something back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and he did not have a very good VO2 max, which is wow. ridiculous, right? But what he had was an incredibly high lactate threshold. Oh, and what yeah, that no, I meant, didn't have that either. What that <laughs> meant was he could almost run at his maximum without accumulating lactic acid. How does that work? I've got a friend, Dean Canessis, like that as well. Like he, It's just, I mean, that's it, just luck. I mean, that's just genetic luck. Yeah, no, I didn't. You know, it. there's a few things that you can do to buff a lactic acid. I, you know, like, but we won't talk about that. But I, I, it's yeah, like some people just are born with physiology that actually, as we all know, predisposes them to be better than, way better than average at certain things. You know, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I was never going to be a bloody dancer or something, but if. I have naturally really strong hips and legs. And if mm. I ever, ever had decided to be a cyclist, I might've been okay at it, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, but if I had a wanted to be a distance runner, not, you know? Yep. So, yeah, well, and, and I guess that's just part of like, when we talk about human optimization in general, which is what you you're about and I'm about, and it's getting the most out of what we have to work with, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, genetics or IQ or potential or talent or resources or, you know, nutrition or is it's like, just how do I, what do I have to work with? What do I want to do, be creating and, and how, how am I going to move from where I am to where I want to be? And for me, that's hot. We were talking briefly before we went live about high performance and, and that's when I talk about high performers, I'm just talking about people who can get the most out of themselves. Mm. Mm. you know and you're that you know and as you said you don't have brilliant genetics but you've done some pretty amazing stuff that's high performance my mum has had cancer three times she's 84 she's soldiering on she's a weapon she's a high performer for what she's got to work with your yes. mum too you know yep. it's like we're not talking about winning a nobel peace prize or an olympic gold medal or curing cancer we're talking about you the listener what do you have to work with and and what can you do with what you've got? Because that's really the best question. Yes, oh, I love that. And it's because yeah, it's about being the best. And that's part of my tagline, being the best that you can be. Yes. And, and bringing out the most in, in people that you're working with and yourself, hopefully, and and living life to the, to the absolute full. And I think, you know, like what I love about you is that your ongoing curiosity has now led you in different paths than where you started from and, you know, mm. physiology and sports and all of that sort of stuff and performance to now doing a PhD at how old are you? Like, I don't know. I just 27? turned 60. Yeah. 60. And you're doing know, a PhD. Dude. That's just epic. Um, And that just shows, you know, like you're not like going, Oh, I'm 60. I'm buggered. I'm old. I'm, 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 I've done my bit for the world. I'm, 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 <laughs> You know, you're just going that, harder. That could be the title of your show today. I'm 60, I'm buggered, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not. Like, this is the thing. That's a role model for me. You're only a couple of years ahead of me. Um, and it is like when you think about 60-year-olds when we were kids, the people that were, you know, like my grandparents and things at, at that age were old. And yeah. now we're really like they say, the 60s, the new 40 type of thing. Um, I, I think, you know, and I'm not saying this because I'm 60, but I have all, you know, from when I was 20, I was fascinated with how people age in the way that we think about age. And of course, we can't alter our chronological age, of course. So I can't wake up tomorrow and be 30 or 40 or 50. But, you know, so there's the inevitability of chronological aging, but there's the variability of biological aging, how yeah. we age, yep. how my body ages and how my body works at whatever chronological age I am. And we all know, we all know fifty-year-olds who are young, and forty-year-olds who are old. Mm. Or we know, you know, like my mum, who's been through a bunch. She's eighty-four, and my dad's eighty-four, and 
for their age, they are way better than the tip, the average person, no disrespect that age. And so it's like, we can't, we can't, uh, manipulate the cr chronology but what we can do is go well how can i age well how can i be atypical and not from an ego or vanity point of view but from a function point of view yeah, function. and i know that <clears throat> like it me doing a phd i started when i was 56 right and i'll hopefully finish in about 12 months so when i get my doctorate i'll be 61 right mm -hmm. and that's not that's not good or bad but it's what's interesting is that that really is a surprise to people. Um, and I get that. And I, but I wish it wasn't a surprise. Mm -hmm. Like I wish, I wish more 50, 60 and 70 year olds were saying, what can I learn? What can I get better at? Mm -hmm. How can I improve? And not from a point of view of insecurity or uh, I don't know, some kind of need to impress, but rather we have the capacity to keep learning, to keep evolving, to keep adapting in a way which is not typical so that a 70 year old doesn't need to walk around in inverted commas, a typical 70 year old body with 70 year old function. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and the truth is that a very, very small percentage of the population, in my opinion, asterisk, mm -hmm. um, optimize what they have to work with. And so there's a level of degeneration and deterioration that happens that is unnecessary. Absolutely. And the reason that people deteriorate and degenerate, many of them at the rate that they do, is not because it's genetically um, predetermined, but because they eat shit, they don't move, they make bad choices, mm -hmm. they don't they don't use what they've got to work with. And the reason that, you know, like I'm in touch wood, not bad shape, and all of those things is. I just do the things that produce that outcome. I'm not special. I'm not gifted. I, as I said before, I don't have great genetics, but it's like, I've never had alcohol in my life. I'm not suggesting anyone else does that. I've never been high. I've never had, I've never smoked. I've never used yeah. recreational drugs. I train every day of my life. I eat two meals a day. I understand how my body works. And so what's not possible is for me to be 30 years old. But what is possible for me is to figure out at my age with my genetics, with my resources, with my goals, which is to live well and long, what's the best protocol for me? And yeah. my body will tell me, and my body has told me, you know, and, and, and we you're can optimize. Yeah. We can all do that. We can all pay attention. You know, your body is wisdom. Your body is intelligence. It is always talking to you. Yep. And you've just got to be able to, to to listen, to understand, and this is where the education piece is, comes in, and also listening to your body, and not just um, social, because we're socially conditioned to do certain things, and to eat certain ways, and to, you know, and then start to question those things, start to question, you know, do I need this breakfast, or do I need this dinner, or do I need uh, eight ounces of water a day, or do I, you know, like, where did all these things that we've been told come from and go and look, is it actually relevant? And, you know, on the aging front, because I'm at the forefront of study on, in, in the longevity space, well, we can mm. actually reverse aging now and we can very definitely we slow it now. And uh, some of the interventions that are around now, not, I'm not talking about the crazy stuff that's in the pipeline that's coming, but this is what makes me excited is that if we can hold our stuff together for another few years, then we're going to have access to stuff to really slow it down. I've been interviewing um, the CEO of um, True Diagnostic a couple of times in the last few weeks. Yeah. And, and they're a company that looks at biological aging, right, versus chronological aging. They use all sorts of different clocks. They've just brought out a new one, which is to do with fit age. Now, I think the, the science still has a way to go but we're sort of at the iPhone one stage, you know, we're going to be heading yeah. to the iPhone 15 stage and there's bugs in the, in the, in the reports and there's problems. I mean, I got my um, fit age report back expecting to see it pretty much off the scales and some of the things that they can tell that they can tell you based on algorithms. So based on um, hundreds of thousands of other people's data then yeah. they extrapolate that according to what you're looking at and they can work out things like your gait speed, your grip strength from a blood draw, not okay. from, yeah. Yeah, and, wow. Yeah, and but 
you know, I just given them some feedback. They came back that my grip strength, while well, I was in the lowest 25% of the population. Now I know I'm in the top 1%. Yeah. I know from actual doing grip strength tests. I'm in the yeah. top 1% of women of my age, like I'm off the scales, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's something, you know, not quite matting up there. And there's a few other things. And they, but they, they're approximating, there's lots of other ones. There's one called the Dunedin Pace Study. This one is the most accurate that we have currently. And that is looking at the rate of aging. So for every chronological year that you live, how yeah. how much are you aging? Mine came back at the last test I did was 0.69 for every year that I live. That's off the scales good, right? That's, That's one amazing. of the slowest that they've ever seen. So even and, though you're you're literally chronologically a year older, your body is only aging like 0.69 six, of a year. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Six months. Yeah, and, and I've got to maintain that, right? Because if I uh, had a stressor in the last few weeks yeah. or whatever, then that can change. But that rate of aging, if you can keep it below one, mm. then you are – um, massively lowering your risk of disease because the biggest risk factor for dying is age. Now yeah. that might sound more well, obviously, no, age is a disease. We're trying to get that the, the 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 you know the people in the space are trying to get that recognized as a disease that we can cure. Because if aging is a disease, then we are able to go after it with targets, with drugs, with supplements, with things we yeah. can because it's a, it's a thing. Right. Yeah. When aging is just well, that's just an inevitable part of thing of, of of living, then it's not considered a disease. So there's big debates about is it a disease or is it not a disease? Mm. And when it is is classed classed as a disease, then we can go after it much more clearly with our research, right? Because then mm. we can we can have measurements. Are we slowing aging? And this is why this science is really, really important, even though there are still bugs in the system at this point. Mm. And there's different clocks and there's different, they have immune clocks, they have fit age clocks, they have extrinsic and intrinsic, and they can look at your blood markers and they can do all this crazy stuff. But what what's going to come out of it is pretty soon we're going to know the age of your heart, what the age of your lung is. Because if we know the, the specific age of all the organs, mm. then, you know, all it takes is one organ to let go and you let go, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you might be aging quite well, most of you, but your heart isn't for some particular reason. Yeah. If we can pick that up, then we can target interventions on the heart. Mm. And with some of the testing, they can already tell that there's something going on with this person. Like when we do the immune age testing, we can go, whoa, there's something going on with this person and send them off for further testing. And then they have been able to pick up people with cancer or whatever, because they've been able to get early stage information. And this is really... I'm excited for how this is going to develop in the next couple of years. I'm, I'm offering the testing now in my company and what I do, mm. and it, we're just learning how to interpret the reports. And it's very, it's an it's exciting, evolving space. But the most important one at the moment, I think, with two, the immune age and the rate of aging. If you can get those in a, in a good place, then you're really going to do well. If in it, like if we can reverse the age of the population of the world by just seven years. Mm. So you as a 50, uh, uh, 60 year old, if I, if you actually came back at a chronological age of 53, we would just drop your risk of all diseases of all mortality by 50%. Mm. And seven years is not impossible. Mm. That's mm. actually quite doable. Amazing. Yeah. 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 Might've got stats wrong, but it's like two years um, is going to have a massive impact if we can just reverse your aging by two years and we can do that mm. you know like you can do that with interventions so this is where um we 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 optim like you and I are optimizing our lifestyle you know probably well for me it's stress it's the one thing that I haven't got under control um you know the diet the lifestyle the exercise mm. all of that sort of stuff the sleep optimizing all of that um but then we're still aging right but when we can start to add in a few of these other interventions, mm. you know, um, that uh, have to be personalized to you, but my, my, my regime is pretty extensive, for example, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm on things like rapamycin 
and um, I've just swapped metformin for berberine because I think mm-hmm. that's actually a better option. And you'd think, why the hell would you be doing that? It's because I know the data around blood sugar regulation. You know, mm-hmm. I know I need to be on top of my blood sugar regulation. Mm-hmm. I know that I need to get rid of senescent cells. So I've done my research and I do things for me um, in conjunction with doctors, by the way, um, with some of those things. And then other interventions which are um, not medical interventions, but that I can just do as Joe Citizen, um, you know, that we can all put into our mix. Yeah. Of, you know. it's, I mean, yeah, th- this is the thing is that there's so much that we know, there's so much that we don't know. Mm. And, and you know, it's like you you are very much N equals one. You are the, you are the, the researcher and you are the participant in your own study. And yep. we can all do that to an extent. Um, and it's, the 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 stress and anxiety one is really interesting because that brings the psychology into the realm of the physiology mm. you know because thoughts have thoughts uh which are non-physical things have physical consequences you know yeah, so yeah. you know uh thinking affects emotion emotion affects physiology and and this whole idea of i talk to people about this a lot lisa the way that we create our own experiences you know and on a physical level that's like if i for example right now and i'm home alone but if i think that i hear someone outside the door that's behind me and i have this thought oh i'm in danger now Mm -hmm. there is a threat you know but and by the way there's nobody there but i think there is and i believe there is now that's just a construct that's a thought an idea a story it's not real though. But if I believe it's real, then within a short period of time, now I'm in a state of a physiological state of stress or distress. So elevated blood pressure, heart rate, adrenaline, cortisol, all of these things and my body and I, <laughs> all yeah. of us, we are now in a stress state that I created with a thought, despite the fact that the situation I'm in doesn't require me to be elevated or stressed or hypervigilant or my sympathetic nervous system to be activated. All of that's happening and all of that happened unnecessarily and it happened because of me. And so trying to understand the relationship between my mind and my body for good and bad, Mm. you know, there's an area of research called psychoneuroimmunology, which talks about what's happening in your mind and your immune system. Yep. And we know if we break it down in simple terms, like if you love your dog and you lie on the floor with your dog and you're cuddling your dog and there's a whole lot of licking and hugging and love and now you're changing the biochemistry of your brain and that's influencing the rest of your body and now you're calming the farm and your parasympathetic nervous system has switched in, sympathetic nervous system switched and right? And that's just from fucking lying on the floor with your dog. But yeah. conversely... If you're scared of dogs and a dog comes up to you, the opposite's going to happen. Now, all of these are individual responses to a particular stimulus. You know, I wrote an uh, I wrote an article yes or a post yesterday about, and this is just a funny thing, but about um, essentially that my point was the way that we create our own experiences. You know that I swear a fair bit, right? And I swear in my <laughs> podcast. I swear yeah. in my writing, I've got a book that's got fuck on the front cover, <laughs> you know, it's, and that's my biggest selling book. But what's interesting to me, and it's not about swearing, it's about thinking and the byproduct of thinking is that I can say fuck, one person thinks it's funny, one person's amused, another person doesn't really notice it because they swear like me, they shrug their shoulders, someone's thinks it's probably a bit inappropriate Inappropriate. and someone else is deeply offended, right? Yeah. yeah. But all of those responses, one, they're real for the individual, but two, they're created by the individual, not by the word. And then, and then you go, Oh, like I am literally creating this state of offense myself because of my story about that particular stimulus, Mm. the stimulus in this case being the word fuck. Right. (laughs) Now it's, it's just, and all that is, is an exercise in metacognition, which is to think about how I think, to think about how I respond to how I think, yep. and then to think about what is the role of my thinking in my health, which nobody thinks about. 
And then we talk to people like Professor Jeffrey Redeker, who I've had on a couple of times from Harvard Medical School, who talks about spontaneous healing and placebos. Yeah. And, and you think about, oh, fuck, my mind is a really powerful variable in my health. My psychology has a huge impact on my physiology, but I don't know how to manage my fucking mind. Yeah. Because I'm the world champion overthinker. I'm a gold <laughs> medalist. You know, <laughs> it's like I don't manage it. It manages me. Yeah. You know, so trying to think about and me me saying this doesn't give anyone a solution but it's just opening the door on oh, okay so i am not a body and i'm not a mind and i'm not a bunch of emotions and i'm i'm all of it like i'm all of it all of the time yep you know so yes you know we can have somebody who let's say in some alternate reality they've got the perfect diet if such a thing exists perfect amount of sleep perfect amount of hydration and exercise program and everything's perfect, but they can't manage their mind. They're constantly putting themselves in a catabolic state because of stress and anxiety that's self-created and da, da, da. like you can manage anything, but if you can't manage your mind, you can't be well. Yep. So and that's, and that's you know, this is that understanding of you can get great diet, great sleep, great exercise, but if all day, every day you're you're sending yourself down a cognitive rabbit hole of doom and gloom, mm. that shit's going to come back to bite you on the ass. Yeah, and that's I think one thing that you know, like I personally do struggle with, um, and I think a lot of us do. <laughs> you know, know, like that think... makes that makes you normal, not bad, not <laughs> broken, not weak. That makes you completely normal, and it's yeah. just. You know, I work on this a lot with people is that just that, how do I manage me? Because if you can, I believe that for those of us living in relative first world comfort, and mm -hmm. by that, I don't mean rich, but we've got food, we've got security, we've got lighting, we've got heating, we've got cooling, we've got a bed, got a few bucks. I think beyond that, our biggest challenge is managing our mind because your mind is basically UHQ. Your mind is where all your choices, decisions, actions, reactions, interpretation, data processing, that's where all of that emanates from. So like nobody accidentally eats junk food. They choose it. Nobody accidentally doesn't work out. They choose that. And so it's thinking about how does my mind intersect with my behaviors and my outcomes? And then how do I, you know, I reckon if Control we all just it. spent, if our biggest project for the next year was learning how to self-regulate with our mm. mind, mm. how to turn down the crazy, how to turn down the overthinking, how to stop saying yes to things we should say no to. I'm not good at that. You know, it's like <laughs> how to stop being the fucking chronic people pleaser, how to stop <laughs> exhausting yourself. Yeah. Like we are... Was this meant to be a counseling session for me? Well, it, I mean, but it's true. Like it's That's nice so to be not, like, you're a nice person. I'm a nice person. Sometimes I'm a prick, I guess. I try not to be, but, but <laughs> my one of, I know for me, for example, I have to have a purpose bigger than me because mm. otherwise I'm a selfish prick. Mm -hmm. Right. So I need to help people. I need to serve people, but also I need to know when to go, nah, nah. Cause it's nice to be nice, but it's not nice to be an emotional doormat mm. and every second person, especially women, because women are mm. amazing and kind and generous and selfless. It's nice to be nice, mum, but it's nice to look after yourself because if you are always giving and never getting, you're going to be a three out of 10 emotionally, mentally, and physically. And then you not only can't you be great for you, you can't be great for anyone else. And people think when I say you need to prioritize you, that I'm saying you need to be selfish. I'm not. I'm saying you need to be smart. You need to look after, yeah, you need to care for your family, protect them, all of that. But you also need to, I think sometimes, you know, turn down all the science and everything for a moment and the research and all of that's great, but just go, all right, just me. What do I know? What's working in my life? What's not? Is this relationship working? Is this behavior working? Is the way that I do money working? Is the way that I eat? Is it working? Is this job working for me? Is this like our life is always giving us data. It's always telling us something. 
And our job as conscious, intelligent creators and designers of our own life is to pay attention to the evidence, the data, and go, well, I know that this isn't working, but nonetheless, I keep doing it. Why the fuck am I still doing this thing that doesn't work? And again, the recognition is not the solution, but it's the start of the solution. And like where, you, where do you come into the solution? Like, where do you actually go? Well, you can't like, change the thing you won't acknowledge, right? Right. So, so step one is, you know, so self-reflection, self-awareness, mm -hmm. um, and then stepping into self-regulation. It's like, all right, I realize that, let's say, for example, I have a toxic relationship with food. You know, I love food. I use, I, I'm just talking about a, a, an example person. Mm, mm. I talk to, you know, if I've got a room of a hundred people, I say, put up your hand. If, if you and food have an interesting relationship, right? And nearly every <laughs> hand goes up and I go, well, and put up, put up your hand. If at times you do things, which is really um, self-destructive in terms, you know, it's not good for your health, not good for your self-esteem, not good for your emotional system. You know, you medicate with food, you reward yourself with food, you make dumb choice, you know, and again, this is not, this is not self-loathing. This is self-awareness because that was me. I mean, I spent my first 30 years of my life just really uh, having a very toxic relationship with food yeah. and yeah. I was the problem, right? But you can't fix what you won't acknowledge. And so once we own up and step up and go, look, this is what I do. I mean, Lisa, I used to, I used to tell as an exercise scientist and trainer and gym owner and high profile fitness industry person in Australia, I would tell people to do stuff that I wasn't doing myself. That's how out of control I was. I, I knew what to do, but I didn't do what I knew. Right. Yep. And that was because a whole bunch of psychological and emotional and social issues around food and self-esteem mm. and being mm. a morbidly obese child and all of this shit. But the, but forget the reasons, the problem, the problem existed. And I needed to get to the point where I went, okay, I'm putting up my hand. I'm full of shit. I'm doing stuff that I know I shouldn't do. And I'm doing stuff that I would tell others not to do. I need to be authentic and I need to, because when it came to food for me, and this is just a unique example, it could be anything else, any other behavior or any other component of your life. But for me, I'm kind of like an addict. You know, if I open the cheesecake door, I'm fucked. Mm -hmm. right? The whole it, lot's gone. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I'm like, you wouldn't say to an alcoholic, just have one beer. Don't be ridiculous. Just have one beer because yeah. we know it's not about the beer. It's about the psychological, emotional, sociological, behavioral response. So for me, for example, even though I'm relatively educated and not completely stupid, I still have to self-manage carefully around the daily yeah like i've created a good operating system mm -hmm. but then let's uh, okay you go so then all right we recognize this where do we start well where do we start is we create a process based on who we are and how we are and what we want to be structure accountability um, accountability is massive so me realizing i need to change something there's a difference between right, I'm now consciously behaving differently and I'm doing that because I've got structure, accountability, self-control, awareness, and a degree of motivation. There's a difference between that and then we fast forward to two years later where we go, okay, now I've changed my subconscious programming. Now this thing that used to require discipline, self-control, and inspiration, it doesn't anymore because this is just how I am now. Because you've so created me, a the, habit yes, around it. So what happens is when you change your default setting for real, right, then then you do those things on autopilot. So now I, I don't really struggle with food, but I just need to be wise. But I eat breakfast, I eat dinner, which is not a recommendation for anyone. That just works for me. So my life is quite um, uh, repetitious in a way, yeah. Yeah. in a way. Yep. But that repetition, that program works for my body and my mind. <clears throat> yep. And so that's, you know, with everything, whether or not it's what job do you do? What kind of relationship are you in? What kind of lifestyle have you created? Uh, what do you put in your mouth? You know, what supplements do you, like all of these things are variables that we need to figure out how we 
best operate in relation to that component of our existence. Because just because Lisa takes A, B, and C doesn't mean Craig should take A, B, and C because I'm not you, you're not me, I don't have your body. Mm. You know, so that's why at the very best, conversations like this are a starting point for people. Yeah, and a recognition of some Yeah, things and that... like a bit of information, a bit of inspiration, and then what the listener does or doesn't do is then up to them because, you know, ultimately the only person who can change anyone is that person. Yeah, and I think, you know, what's one of the important things is to take away the baggage associated with you know, like things like food or alcohol or whatever, get rid of the guilt, get rid of the blame, try and look at where the heck this came from, try and work through it, maybe get someone like Craig to take you through and to look yourself in the mirror. And But to actually, because it's easy to get down on yourself and when you get down on yourself because you feel bad, you feel guilty, then you're in another cycle of, of crap, basically, where you, 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 you're perpetuating the cycle because... You know, what do, what do people do generally? Like when you when you're down, you look for comfort. And the way our bodies in, in, in if you think about it also from a um, survival point of view, we were programmed to seek out high carb foods because they weren't enough around. And so it made sense that our instinctive selves, our drivers, are for sex, are for food, are for you know. These, these things that we still go after, but we're living in a different environment than we did back in the day, in mm. the caveman days, where we had to go and find the carbs, find the food, find the go hunting, mm. go you know fishing, go gathering. Now we have it on every street corner, but we've still got those instinctive drivers going on in the background. And then yeah. we've also got all these genetic predispositions. And so like we're complicated. Well, we're complicated. And so taking the blame out of the question, mm. I think is important. And then just working around, well, okay, yeah, got, got this issue. How do I deal with it? What do I do? Who do I put around me? What little, and the other thing is that, you know, that making little changes at a time, if you yeah. overwhelm yourself from this day forward, I'm never, ever going to touch a drop of alcohol again. I'm <laughs> never, ever going to have one chocolate yeah. bar. I'm never, ever, you're doomed to bloody failure, really, because yeah. you've just set yourself up for a massive Whereas if you, today I'm going to drink more water, mm. then I'm doing that for the next 30 days, you know, or 100%. I'm focusing on one thing and making a small change. And then one, I've incorporated that into my habit, my rituals. And like you said, my, my day too is very ritualized, is very routine, yes. is very organized, is my operating structure so that I can, um, so that I can function and, and, and be a high performer despite whatever's going on as you know as best as I can. Um, and that that gives me a framework. When that framework's thrown out, which I do periodically, I, and I think is a, a good thing to do, um, you know, like not so much now in my life because of mum and I can't travel much and I can't, you know, do things, but I used to go and, you know, put myself in an environment that scared the crap out of me. Um, doing an ultra marathon or something somewhere in another environment, in another culture where you're going without food, without warmth, without, you know, you're exhausted, you're dehydrated, you're whatever you are in that situation in order to throw yourself out of this comfort zone that you live in on a day-to-day -day basis. Because mm. then when you, you come back, it does shake you up. It shakes you up massively while you're there, but it also shakes you up when you come home and you've got to refit back into the normal world again, you come back with a new perspective, a new outlook, a new gratitude often for the bed that you have and the shower that you have and the food that you have. Mm. Um, and that's a really good thing for us all to experience. I think, you know, um, 100%. yeah. Chucking yourself out of that comfort zone. It doesn't have to be in an ultra marathon or in the Himalayas or something. It could be just, you know, doing something small that's outside of your comfort zone occasionally. Yeah. And I, I think that, I mean, we've spoken about this before, but it's always a good thing to revisit is that discomfort's not the enemy, you know, yeah, not, not all pain is bad. You know, for me, no. the vast majority, the vast majority of my growth and learning and development and understanding and insight and skill and resilience has come from doing hard shit. Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't grow when I'm comfortable. I I love comfort, 
but mm. I'm also comfortable in the middle of discomfort. You know, it's, it's like, we've spoken about this too, but literally how do you, how do you become an ultra endurance athlete? Well, pain essentially. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> pain. To deal with you know, there's a bunch <laughs> of other things, but pain, how do you get stronger, bigger, fitter, leaner, lighter? How do you change your body? in the gym or any training environment, well, you, essentially you go and you force it to adapt by doing all these things to it. You know, how do you build strength? You literally work against resistance. How do you build mental and emotional strength? You work against mental and emotional resistance, you know? And that I think, you know, what I found really liberating is even when I started my show and we're 1,350 or so episodes deep, Crazy. I remember, you know, there was a while where I, I, I think I was always reasonably authentic, but I was quite worried about just opening the door wide and going, all right, everybody, here's what I'm really like. <laughs> I'm actually a bit fucked up. Uh, um, I've got some issues. Hey, look, we're all friends. Bring it in. Uh, I've got some issues. I struggle with shit. I do dumb stuff. I make dumb decisions. I live out, live out of alignment with my own values sometimes. I, I'm i a fucking embarrassment. Let's be honest. You know, all that, right? But the moment that the moment that I went, I look, it. yeah, I know some stuff. I'm a bit educated, of, you know, but also I'm a periodic fuck up. The moment that I did that and just went, oh, let me tell you about my issues with food. Let me tell you about my commitment issues. Of course, I'm, I've been single my whole life. And people go, you've got commitment issues. Yes, I fucking have. Sit down, let me tell you. Right? <laughs> of course. Like if I, Craig Harper, wait until I've got everything figured out and all my shit together before I do a podcast or a lecture or write a book, I'm never doing any work. Yeah. Because I'm a work in progress. And I'm yeah. some, I'm sometimes I'm brilliant. Sometimes I'm a fuckwit. And sometimes <laughs> that happens all before lunch. <laughs> right? I mean. And you so, should have gone and been a comedian as well. But I think, you know, we just got to go, look, you know, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I mean, this message is for the listeners. Like we worry so much about what other people think. Fuck all that. You know, that doesn't mean you've got to divulge to every person your deepest and darkest, but it's just like, okay, so you've got food issues or you've got body issues or you don't like how you feel. Or, that's okay. We get it. That's me too. That's the person next to you too. These, these things that we, you know, we essentially have this inner dialogue of, oh, uh, if people knew how I think, if people knew what goes on in my mind, oh, nobody would. Well, that's everyone. Everyone thinks that. <laughs> everyone <laughs> thinks they're the worst, the craziest, the, the biggest imposter. That's everyone, you oh, know, except it. for a few random sociopaths. Yeah, exactly. And if you don't think that, then you're probably a real <laughs> arrogant. They're person. the best all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the other ones most living most inauthentically <laughs> that's 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 so true but yeah yeah, yeah and, I mean, and, and it is and, and and this is the thing eh? you look at your achievements and what you've done and you're like wow 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 and then it's so um I think it's wonderful that you're like that and I've, I've done the same thing on this show it is what it is and it's you know it's open it's real it's raw it's you know <laughs> vulnerable it's yeah. um and and it's scary when you do that, and when you write a book about your life, you know, which yeah. I've written a couple, and yeah. um, and you're putting it all out there, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> how are people going to react to that? Um, yeah. Inadvertently, I found that most of the time people react very positively because they're like, well, I can relate to you. I couldn't relate to you, the super athlete, like you just yeah. said at the beginning. You had amazing genetics. Totally wrong. You know, I couldn't. <laughs> you know. Um, but people can relate to you if you are just another struggling human being, but you had a couple of wins along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. and, and you just, you just, but you're a fighter, you know, like if there's one thing I am, it's a fighter. And, you know, all people, oh, people would be, you know, like come up to me. I was at a doctor's the other day with mum, a gerontologist, lovely person. But when I said, you know, like we're fighters, you know, we don't give up. We're mm. warriors. And he's mm. going, oh, I have a problem with that. You know, you need to do acceptance. And I'm like, no, I don't need to do acceptance. Yeah. I'm in fight mode. And that's me. And that's who I am. Don't mm. take that away from me. Mm. You know, because, yeah, um, well, you're going to have to accept that this is going to, well, that attitude for me is like, 
well, then I'm giving up on on someone I love. I'm not going to do that until mm. the absolute. I mean, I you know when my dad died, mm. and you know, like uh, I fought to the last second, mm. and mm. that's just who I am. You ha- mm. you don't take don't because you believe it's good to have acceptance and things and given and to um you know everybody's different and everyone has a different path to take and I'm just a warrior mentality and that's why I'm going to stay and and I I think when 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 people say sorry to interrupt sorry like when people say to you um even with good intentions oh you need you need to do you need to be you need I'm like dude shush (laughs) <laughs> like that that's okay that you think that and and that's you don't but don't tell me how i need to think yeah. don't tell me that the way you see it is the way i should see it and i understand where that guy is coming from oh totally lovely person. i understand it i get it and and like it's you know understanding how other people think doesn't mean agreeing with how other people think by the way and understanding how others think, which in psychology is called theory of mind, is a fucking mm-hmm. superpower, by the way, everybody. Really? Um, if you can understand how other people think, you have a distinct advantage in life. Wow. But it doesn't mean that we need to agree with people, even if that person, I mean, it depends on the situation, of course, but but in general terms, day to day, it's we people are always trying to impose their thinking and ideology and standards on others, which Mm -hmm. is why we have so many echo chambers and so much confirmation bias and so much finger pointing and hate. And, you know, if you don't, um, and uh, you know, this is our belief and that's your belief. Therefore you're the enemy. We're right. You're no, it doesn't matter what, like you can think and believe what you want. That's cool. I'm not trying to change you. If you think A and I think B, we can still be friends. If you believe in this and I believe in, if you're an atheist and I'm a Christian or I'm a Buddhist or I'm a, uh, I'm a Muslim or whatever, and you, it doesn't matter. Like we don't all have to be on the same page to coexist harmoniously. Yes. We don't all need need to all agree. We don't all need to disagree. Like there's this other fucking option. Yeah. You know, I'm getting philosophical now, but it's Uh like, I just see so much, so much shit that happens in our world that is unnecessary for the, yeah. for the smartest species. We are overwhelmingly fucking stupid sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing is, and I mean, even I'm guilty of this in my, my clinical work is yet, you know, you've got someone who's sick that come to you. They've got some issues that, you know, some solutions for, or you, you have a protocol or a thing that you want to try with that person um, and it's really hard not to impose, though, your because not everyone is in their phase of development where you are. Yeah. You know? And I want to, I want them to get from here to here in five minutes. That took me ten years. And why aren't you doing it? Yes. You know. Well, <laughs> that's, that's where I have to rein myself in. <laughs> that's right, because they don't think like you. And yeah, that th- like you also have to realize, and I also have to realize, you know, that the way that you live. And the way that I live, which is just two choices that we've made, that's the path we've taken, not better or worse or whatever, but it, it for, for most people, the way that you live and your journey and your story is quite um, exceptional and atypical. But for you, it's totally normal because you're you, you know, and there are things that I, like sometimes I will ask people, people that I'm coaching to do something. And to me, it's the littlest thing. And to them, it's like an insurmountable fucking mountain. I'm like, really? Yeah. But, yeah. And part of me wants to go, come the fuck on. Yeah. Like this is a one out of 10 problem. You're making it a 20, relax, yeah. you know, but I yeah. can't because no. to them, to them, because they're not me. They don't think like me and they're, I'm not better than them. That's for sure. I'm just different. And so for me to connect with people, my my challenge is not to get them to think like me or be like me. My challenge is for me to understand them mm. and meet them where they are at, their level of understanding and motivation and inspiration. And, you know, that's the challenge as a coach, I think, and as a mentor or educator, because... That's hard, isn't it? You know, no, I, like hard. right now, I spend a fair bit of time in the academic space and and sometimes I'll listen to really smart people talk about stuff to a group. 
and and I look at the group and the group have no fucking idea what the person's talking about. <laughs> right? They can't relate because right. this person is talking a language or a message that really isn't resonant with that particular group of humans in that room. Mm. So my question is like, I'm always, you know, with my research, which is broadly relevant because it's about communication, connection, understanding it. It's, you know, it's about understanding how others perceive and process us. Um, and I can, I could talk all the jargon and the science and the data, but one, it, it's boring. Um, for most people. And two, if I just put on the whole kind of academic presentation, no one's going to relate or be inspired. So what I need to do, even with my research is figure out how do I share the stuff that I know? How do I share these thoughts and ideas, messages, strategies, insights in a way which resonates with people mm -hmm. where they there's no confusion? Um, whether or not they do anything with it is a different story. But you know, and as a presenter, which you are, I mean, you stand in front of groups and you're a presenter on your podcast. Like, even with this, we go, how do we have this conversation in a way which kind of is hopefully interesting and resonant with people? You know, because you and I could do a deep dive into the shit we're interested in mm -mm. and we'd be having a great time. And, and a lot of people would go, go to sleep. Uh, this is so boring. <laughs> this is so doesn't interest me. <laughs> you know, so there's that you know, that's a self-awareness exercise and also and it's pitching, uh, pitching it to the audience that's in the room, you know, and you will know this is from your work that yeah. you do. It's it, when I'm talking to school kids, I'm trying and I find that hard actually, but to pitch it's kids or you're pitching it, you know, people working in an office or people working in a factory or people out on the oil rigs or, yeah, you know, like if people with different experiences and you have to change your presentation to fit that audience where they're at. And even on the time of the day, you know, is it 9 a.m. in the morning and they've just had a cup of coffee ready to take stuff in? Or is yeah. it nine o'clock at night in an award ceremony and they're already half drunk? Uh, going to change my pitch, right? <laughs> I'm going to change the way I, I, I speak. Do, I don't do those gigs anymore. I won't talk oh, to audiences that are drinking. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, it's a can, it can it be, can be. But I, you know, I've, I mean, I don't know how many would be speakers, and but I think even for coaches and mentors in general, you know, like I, like you said before, you could have been a comedian or whatever. Which I don't know about that, but I love humor, and the reason that I love using humor is because the moment that you can get someone laughing or smiling, you've created an emotional connection. Mm. I love storytelling because if you can tell a great story that's relevant and meaningful and brings people in, then you've created emotional connection. But if you are just delivering data, <laughs> you're probably going to create more disconnection than connection. You know, so if you can share some important messages like you and I have today, while hopefully having a few stories along the way, a couple of insights, a bit of silliness, then hopefully we're sharing good thoughts and ideas and information that might be helpful for people, but also we're bringing them into an experience, which is nice to be in the middle of. Yeah. It's just fun too. It's all it's of fun it. It's got to be all of that. Yeah. And that's why you I know, like talking to you because it's always interesting. And we well, always just, I, I always mean, get new insights when I'm talking to Craig. Yeah. Like I want people to, like I did a, uh, as you know, before you do a, a corporate gig, generally you do a briefing. I did a briefing mm. yesterday for a gig I've got to do next week. And I was talking to this lady and it's a two hour workshop, which is, you know, short for a workshop, but it's just kind of two hours of interactive stuff with a, a small group. In fact, um, 16 people in a boardroom. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about what she wanted and the theme for the day. And, da, 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 da. and I go, yep. And then I said, but we've got to have fun though. She's like, what? I go, but we've got to have fun though. She, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I go, here's the thing, right? I could deliver on everything you just asked me to deliver on. It could be mind blowingly interesting. It could be a hundred percent relevant and accurate. I go, but if there's no fun, if there's no energy, if there's no stories, if there's no, like it's, it's a dud. So yes, we want good information. Yes. We want relevant content. But we also want people to walk away from that two hours and go, that was fucking great. Yeah. Let's get him back. 
you know, that's, we want that, whether or not they get me back is irrelevant, but it's like, I want to educate, inspire, inform, connect, and, and, but I also want people to have a good time. Yeah. Because if they don't have a good time, what's the point? That's awesome. I love that. You know, because you learn to just... when you're when you're yeah. having a good time. You don't learn when you're bored. Well, you know? nobody wants a bloke doing a fucking two hour monologue. No, and it, this is like, even Andrew Huberman. You know the Huberman podcast. He says like the more adrenaline that you can associate around the learning, yes. um, the more you it will imprint and it will stay. So he recommends people go out for a run afterwards or have a cold bath or do something to give your body a bit of a shocker. So that yeah. the, the memories stay, but you can actually incorporate that idea into what you're doing. So if you can get them laughing, connecting, responding on an emotional level, then they'll take the in, the the insights in much better as well and keep them, I believe, than when you just present things in graphs and data and, you know, even though you're doing the same thing. But that's the skill that, you know, you, you, you're trying to develop as a, as a presenter work in progress um, so that you can make it engaging at the same time as being super educational. 100%. Yeah. And then you get them to stand up and go for a run out the door and go for a 20 minute run. <laughs> I don't know there you go. Yeah. <laughs> or you stick them in a plunge pool. <laughs> the end of your conference. Well, like <laughs> then they'll never forget you. <laughs> if, if, for example, in relation to this, if I, not that I would, but if let's say I stood up and I talked to the group about, childhood obesity which i could talk about right mm -hmm. and you go this is the graphs this is the data this is 1970 this is 1980 this is what blah 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 blah, blah and people go ah. or i stand up and i talk to them about me being the fattest kid in my school and i talk about my story and the psychology the emotion the physiology the sociology around that how yeah. i felt what i did about it people are in and i'm still talking about childhood obesity yep beautiful I'm just yep. telling them my childhood obesity story yep. and people are much more engaged than, Oh, here's some data, you know? And I think understanding that, that, you know, people worry so much about their content and don't even think about the connection, yep. you know, and the yep. connection's more important. If you've got great content and no connection, it's going to be a shit experience. Oh man. I'm, I'm going to take content, that away. I'm if you've got average that. content, but great connection, it's going to be a good experience. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take that away and everything that I do now and think about it, where is the connection? I'm not just delivering this piece of information, but how do I connect it to my story, my life, or some somebody's story that I can make that 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 connection for people? Because 100%. I do think you you yeah, I think I I think I inherently do tend to do that, but it, you've just actually made that a thing for me. All right, I'll send you a bill. You're welcome. <laughs> that'd be, that'd Thanks, be ten dollars. Plus GST. <laughs> no, but it's it's so it is so key, and because I'm writing a piece on hydration at the moment, for example, and you know I'm pulling out all the stats and the things and the things, and I'm like, eh, actually, I I I, I want to tell the, the story about the time I nearly died in the Yukon when I had a tetany seizure because my electrolytes were out. Then yeah. that might get the point across more. I would, are I would start with that. Yeah, I would start with that. <laughs> Yeah, I do. You know? Yeah. Rather than, you know, if you are 120 kilos, you need X, Y, Z. And if you're 50 well, kilos and this temperature, you need that. And you know. I mean, even I just say to even corporate groups, I go, so your body's, you know, mostly water, 65, 70% water or whatever. Your blood's 90% water. Your brain's 90% water or whatever it is, right? Yep. And you just go, so here's some of the things that happen or can happen when you're a bit dehydrated. Well, you get dumber. What? Yep, you get dumber. Your brain doesn't work as well, right? Your blood gets thicker or more viscous. Your heart's got to work harder. You're more predisposed to stroke and heart attack. And and like that's <laughs> just because you haven't had a fucking glass of water, right? So <laughs> like, and then people pay attention. Yeah. You go, oh yeah, you're mostly water. So what happens when you don't put water into that mostly water body? Well, bad things. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, then you can wheel out the stats if you like, but- yeah, that this that like if if people really get it straight up, then you bring them in and they're engaged. Yeah, that's so much more powerful than you need yeah. X, Y, Z. 
Craig, you've been epic today again. I really enjoy our conversations. Can we do it again in a few months and see where you're at with your PhD? Well, it depends if you pay that $11 bill, the 10 plus GST. (laughs) If if I see that come across my desk, we'll do another one. (laughs) Only if you come and do some age testing with me, we'll see how well you're doing. (laughs) Fuck, I'm scared of that. You might tell me I'm just deluded and I'm actually 92. I want (laughs) to stay in my delusion. No, you might find that you're actually biologically way younger. So then you can start saying, well, actually, I'm only 47, you know, (laughs) chronological. Well, it's, 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 um, you know, completely doable. (laughs) If I was on Tinder, I'd put that on Tinder. I'm chronologically really 47. Yeah. Well, hey, there's a good reason for it. (laughs) Let's not do an episode on dating apps. I've never been on one and never will be on one. No, definitely not. Uh, Lisa, thank you for having me. You're you're a champion. (laughs) Love it. Love it, Craig. You have a fabulous day and thanks so much for being on the show. Where can people find you, your podcast and everything else? So my podcast is called The You Project. Uh, I'm on Instagram, which is just Craig Anthony Harper. Uh, And, uh, you know, just drop into my house anytime. I'm in Hampton. (laughs) Don't do that. No, don't do that. <laughs> no, but do follow him. He's absolutely hilarious. Uh, as long as you don't mind the swear words. And then if you if you do mind the swear words, examine why you're being offended. <laughs> uh, yeah, do that. Oh, also, I've got a new, well, my website is craigharper.net and I've got a new program. I don't know when this will go live. Yes, next tell us. Week, next week on the 22nd, as we're recording this on the 15th, sorry if I'm not meant to say that, Lisa, but on the 22nd. I'm starting a uh, a new. It's only a four week program, but it's it's all about. It's called preseason 2024, and uh, if I can just quickly say that one of my frustrations is that that you know I talk to a lot of people who don't do anything, right? Yeah. Who go, oh yep, yep, yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I see them two years later, and they and they haven't. And so this program is really about, um, this is a coaching program. It's not an educate. I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach you too much. It's not, I'm going to do a lecture every Wednesday night at eight. It's I'm going to do a coaching session and I'm going to coach people into the action and the behavior and to create some momentum and get the wheels turning. But if you want to learn about that, just go to my website, craigharper.net, go into the shop bit. Um, And I will say, which is terrible self-promotion, it's not for everyone. It's actually (laughs) for people who are ready to roll up their sleeves. And if you're not ready to roll up your sleeves, I mean this loving, caring way, it definitely ain't for you. Yeah. Wait till you are. Yeah. No, that's that's fabulous. And you've got lots of um, courses. You do a lot of speaking, a lot of books, a lot of PhD stuff. Yep. Everything on there. Hit me up if you want me to come and talk to your company. I'm I'm extremely expensive, but amazing. <laughs> I'm only kidding. And you are. <laughs> Both I'm of not. Those. I'm not amazing, as you heard before. <laughs> Just Thanks, <expensive>. Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. We'll catch you soon.